All right, thanks for joining us. This is John Kane with Regan DeLoggins, and this is Let's Talk. I've uh, been gone for a couple of weeks, so we're happy to be back. Well, I haven't been completely gone. I still did my show. I just did it back home. So not on WBI, but still always on Facebook Live as we are today. You can you can follow the show on Facebook Live. We take this show and we put it up as a podcast with my Let's Talk Native podcast. And I take the video of our uh, Facebook Live streaming and I put it up on YouTube on our YouTube channel, which is Let's Talk Native TV. So if you catch only a piece of this and you want to catch more of it, you can always go and catch, uh, catch us there. Plus, you can catch the show that I do back home uh, in Seneca Territory, which is Let's Talk Native. So uh, I welcome you to subscribe to our videos, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, and subscribe to uh, to our podcast. And again, those podcasts, uh, you can you can be found on any of your podcast uh, favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify, which is kind of a, a newer addition. So um, again, uh, great to be back. Um, uh, look, I've, I've got to, I always have to start the show. I gotta, I'm sorry. I got to stand up a little bit. Um, for those of you watching, uh, you got to see my new my shirt. You may have seen it if you saw my other show. Um, if you're not watching, I'll I'll explain it. So first, let me let me just do a little bit of a of a of, of a modeling. We're now a fashion show. Okay. Go ahead, Regan. <laughs> it's good. It says uh, December twenty sixth, eighteen sixty two, Dakota thirty eight. And it's got a picture of Abraham Lincoln holding a noose. Um, you know, look, it's interesting that didn't uh, isn't there like an effort right now to to make lynching finally a, a crime? It's yeah, it, it just <laughs> I think it now. The house, I think. Uh, yeah, I think it just passed. I think they call it the Emmett Till. Yeah, right. The right, Emmett right. Till yeah. wrote along. Yeah. But of course, they. You know, I, I just think it's important that people realize that um, Native people were lynched um, at a pretty. <laughs> You know, a pretty substantial level, considering our population. Um, and some of that lynching came at the hands of the federal government, including, uh, yes, the great emancipator, uh, Abraham Lincoln. Again, December 26th, day after Christmas, 1862. Uh, you know, I've talked about it before. So, um, and this is my shirt. I, I, I had this shirt. And we've got a bunch of other stuff like this. Uh, go to my website. It's letstalknative.com. And you can find uh, some of the stuff that we have there. But uh, um, all right. Look, I, I understand everything's coronavirus. Uh, <laughs> uh, Wall Street is crashing. Um, Democrats are, you know, uh, beating each other up. Um, are they though? Uh, well, you know, <laughs> kind of. Well, well, I don't know. They're, if they're beating, beating each Bloomberg other up. up. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, that too. Yeah, and um, and and of course, Trump is always in the news cycle. I mean, he, you just you just can't not have him in there because he's just entertainment. That's what he is. But um, that's here. What and and I talked we talked about this a little bit on the last show, but that was you know that's three weeks ago now. So um, there has been a battle um, over pipelines, and many of you know Standing Rock and you know Keystone XL pipeline, you know the Mighty Williams pipe, pipeline, you know, Williams <laughs> the Williams pipeline here in New York. Yeah. But you, I, I you know there's almost like. You know, when people talk about the border, or the wall, there is this information wall that doesn't seem to be, you know, that, that nobody seems to cross. In fact, there there's a, almost a media blackout oftentimes with what happens um, on the Canadian side. Not, mm -hmm. you know, look, there's more there's more Mexican border stuff uh, in, in the news than than anything, you know, this close. And for for those of us who are native who live um, who, who had a border, whether it's the Mexican border, whether it's the Canadian border, run through our territories. Um, that's oftentimes problematic. And, and, you know, and again, from, from a native standpoint, <laughs> the, the experiences we have with the United States government are exactly like the experiences we have with the Canadian government. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, in fact, I'm going to do a video, by the way, Regan, uh, coming up where I have to debunk the whole thing, the whole, isn't Canada, uh, is it Canada, isn't Canada nice? No, it isn't. I mean, it's the place is nice because it, you know, it's just, it's, it's beautiful land. But the people are, they may be more overtly racist, especially towards native people, um, than any other, any other place on, on the planet. You know, I was talking to my dad about this uh, yesterday, um, and he was telling me that, you know, Canada has this this myth of being, oh, everyone's so nice, everyone's welcome, they're more, quote unquote, liberal than us, and therefore it's this, like, paradise. I remember during the, the Trump, uh, the original Trump campaign, and everyone was like, well, if he gets elected, I'm going to Canada, because oh, they have, just they have Trudeau, that. you know, and Trudeau is a settler colonialist and a coward, so. Well, and, and honestly... The liberals aren't in the majority there. I don't know that. I don't know that they have the majority there. Uh, um, 
you know, there's a strong conservative party there, Andrew mm-hmm. Scheer. Um, but let, well, let me get, let me get into it again. So there's been a battle over pipelines on the on the on the Canadian side too. Uh, pr- primarily by native people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, the vast majority of ca- Canadians are almost oblivious to it. Although we have gained a lot of allies in, in, in this battle, but one of the places has been Wet'suwet'en territory out in British Columbia. Uh, and, well, I take it back, two of the places have been in Wet'suwet'en territory in, uh, uh, in British Columbia. And, it, and a lot of these, these movements are led by women, uh, primarily, predominantly, um, and they have the, the backing of the more traditional people, including the what they call the hereditary chiefs. And although I find you know, words like matriarch and hereditary chiefs, for one thing, those words aren't ours. And mm-hmm. sometimes I'm troubled by them. But anyway, that's that's kind of what uh, that's a lot of the reference that is used. Um, and this battle has been going on for 10 years, mm-hmm. as you will tell. You, you will learn if you come to our event tonight at 7.30 at the Brooklyn Commons as we show Invasion. Talk more about that later. I know you've been hearing about it. Um, but this has been going on for 10 years. But just recently, and now it's about three or four weeks ago, the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, uh, went in and essentially attacked the protesters. And, and, and I take it back. They're not protesters. These are people who have stopped uh, uh, um, CNL, uh, CLG, what is it, Canadian, uh, Canada Gat- Something the gas. coastal gas link yeah, pipeline, yeah. coastal gas link. So they've, they've been uh, they, they've been stopping the workers from trying to put a pipeline through their territory, through their mm-hmm. their absolute pristine, beautiful territory. They said, no, you're not putting it through here. And so they sent the RCMP and they roughed up some people, including a bunch of women. And they and they arrested uh, a bunch. I think it was, you know, six or eight. I think that they got arrested originally. And as and in an act of solidarity, Mohawk territories in, in particular, Tandanega more specifically, mm-hmm. which is a, 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 a Mohawk community between, uh, say, well, let, let's call it between Toronto and, and, uh, and Montreal for you know, just to, so you get an idea of major metropolitan areas. Um, they started blocking rail, uh, rail lines and highways were blocked. But it, 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 in total, there, 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 were, there were rail lines that were blocked. There were highways blocked. There were uh, ports of entry and uh, border crossing. Vancouver you know, bridges. Port was blocked for a while. Yeah, I mean, they've been uh, doing, they've been blocking roads in Toronto um, and, and, and in most native territories that have infrastructure either that goes through or by it, there have been, there have been and, and a lot of this has been, you know, initiated by the Mohawks. And, and I'll explain that. Part of that reason is because of the solidarity that was shown during the Oka crisis back mm-hmm. in 1990, which is a whole other show, and we'll talk about that another time. But it was, it, it was when uh, Canada basically attacked the Mohawks um, in the furtherance of at, expanding a golf course on native lands. Um, and many territories around uh, throughout Canada did similar things. They, they blocked highways. They, they actually you know took down some power lines. They did, they did a lot of things. So... This was the the Mohawks uh, returning the favor, and so these blockades have been going on, and they went on for over two weeks. And uh, well, now it's been almost four weeks. But after after over two weeks, it was really starting to take its toll on Canada. And in fact, they they called a special session in the House of Commons. And yeah, and if you look, I know if you're American, you don't know what the House of Commons is. It's kind of like the <laughs> Congress, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they call a special session of the, of the House of Commons, and that includes bringing in the prime minister. Yes, that's kind of like your president, okay? Um, <laughs> they brought, bring it in the, in, the, in the prime minister and, and ministers from various um, parties and, and regions and that kind of stuff. Um, and that was pretty interesting because you had Justin Trudeau Really, really, just kind of blowing a bunch of smoke up up, up the asses of native people. Basically, <laughs> I mean, there's no other way to describe it. Um, and talking, calling for the removals of, of of the blockades without considering that. The, well, not at first. Not at first. I'm, yeah, that, it, not it, at during first. During the House right, of yeah. Commons, he's saying, "Oh, we need patience, and when patience is in short supply, it's, it's it has more value." And you know, and, and he recited some of the the terrible history of Canada, and uh, and he didn't really condemn the uh, the blockades. 
uh, per se, and he didn't um, speak in any aggressive tones. So then his his party opposition, the uh, the or the opposition party they call it, uh, the conservative Andrew Shear, he gets up there and he says that was the weakest thing I've ever heard in my entire life, and then just condemned Justin Trudeau um, over him not being more aggressive about stopping uh, about stopping. That. And we may show some of the the video from the the House of Commons stuff tonight when, uh, at our event. Yeah. Um, so. So then two days later, Justin Trudeau does, it, does an absolute about face and no longer, all of a sudden, patience was up. And he says, all right. Um, and, and, and it almost sounds condescending, like, like mom talking to children. He says, all right, that's enough. The blockades, the blockades must blockades, come they, down. They must, they must come down. Mm. You know, and, and, it, and it just, I mean, just absolutely paternalistic maternalistic i always say that the 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 conservatives are like paternalistic and the uh or, or they're like the abuse of dad and, and the liberals are like the abuse of mom it's still abuse but uh you know you just frame it nicer i guess um, <laughs> i might so, use that from now on <laughs> so then he calls what he, what he does is he um uh he, he says the blockades must come down he actually gives a, a midnight a midnight deadline mm. um and then, and then he makes you know some real false claims. He's well, you know, um, we we had the RCMP uh, pull back from uh, Wet'suwet'en territory, which, which they, they did not. Didn't. I mean, they may have moved a little bit, but they didn't remove themselves, and they kept doing patrols, and they were there to trying to protect the the gas line workers. You know, the, the basic conditions that um, that you know Mohawks and others were saying in support of the Wet'suwet'en was. You stop putting the pipeline through. You know, get your get your gas line people out of there. Then the RCMP can go home and we can open up the roads. Yeah. But none of that happened. Instead, uh, uh, Justin Trudeau basically uh, gave an ultimatum, and then the next day they went in with, uh, in at least in in Tandanega, they went in with the OPP, the Ontario Provincial Police, and roughed up a, a few people and uh, opened up the uh, the rail line. Well, removed the, the blockade. But yeah, one of the two. And then blockades started blossoming everywhere so mm -hmm. now now even more blockades happening were happening now keep in mind as i said in the beginning this w became the national issue in canada uh, and it was it was you know being addressed at the house of commons i mean this has been the debate and the entire world is watching except for Americans. Apparently, Americans have no idea what's what's going on in, on the Canadian and side. And I think that maybe that this would be a time to kind of clarify what is going on in Wet'suwet'en, because um, I think as Indigenous folks, we know, um, but I think maybe some of the listeners have no idea. Um, so just to give a brief history, uh, Wet'suwet'en territory is in so-called British Columbia. Um, they It's unceded land. It has never and will never be ceded into um, so-called Canada. Um, in 1997, um, this ruling was up upheld during, uh, uh, it was called the Dalgamuk decision, which upheld their sovereignty of the land. So when we look at Canadian maps, they are lying. There is a uh, large portion in so-called British Columbia that is Wet'suwet'en territory that is not Canadian land. Um, and, well, then and, and again, the, the, the Supreme Court ruling was that the Wet'suwet'en held title to the yes, land yes, and yes, so yes. and it couldn't have been more clear in, in terms of the language yeah but but again there's there ends up being this question well well who are the Wet'suwet'en and and what does that really mean and mm -hmm. which always brings me back to things like the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples when we talk about free prior and informed consent mm -hmm. the problem with that is there's somebody else deciding what is consent and they aren't looking at the consent of people they're saying well, who do we give authority to? And so yes. these were ban councils. Yes. We yeah. saw this play out in Cayuga territory last week, a whole other story. But um, ban councils, which always have the political favor of Canada, um, get, you know, get recognized as having this authority where the people and, and oftentimes the, the more traditional forms of, uh, of governance uh, are ignored. Yeah. So this is where this becomes problematic. Because even when you have a land title issue uh, that has been decided in the courts, there seems to be all of this confusion about what that really means. Yeah, and, and I know the ban cancel has been an issue because um, uh, the Canadian uh, government has said that they've received uh, permission from the Wet'suwet'en ban cancel to move through, but th that, that council does not speak for Wet'suwet'en territory, does not speak for the matriarchs or the hereditary chiefs or the folks that live on the land. So back in 2019, um, well, this... Uh, 
as John mentioned, this has been going on for like 10 years, but back in 2019, um, an injunction was served in which the RCMP was going to move forward into Wet'suwet'en territory to um, to make sure that Coastal GasLink was able to build the 670 kilometer long pipeline, which is gonna be shelled gas, which is frack gas. Um, it's a $40 billion pipeline and it's all for export to Asia. So, um, it's not, well, and, and I and I don't want to just gloss over that. I mean, because yeah. one of the arguments with with a lot of this uh, fracking for oil and gas is about energy independence. This is not about energy independence. This is about raping the land for everything that it, that it can offer in terms of dollars and cents to those who will pull the gas out and sell it to, into the global marketplace. Exactly, and, and it and that can't be emphasized enough because the, you know this isn't something that's that's going to be available to the average Canadian. And you know, when they pitch these things as jobs programs, the jobs are very very temporary, and oftentimes they are crews that are moved in to to build these things. They don't. Generally Generate any kind of local em employment opportunities, especially any long-term local employment opportunities. Also, we have to remember that when we're bringing in um, Coastal GasLink is a huge company. Um, it has private security firms that have been hired to come into the territory, along with RCMP, who are there to make sure the injunction, um, it, you know, and to make sure that the Coastal, coastal GasLink can continue to build. Um, this means that this is going to be a new industrial corridor, and but Suwon Territory does not have the infrastructure to maintain that, nor do they consent to the infrastructure that is coming through the land. You know, like the roads have to be built, things have to be built in order to allow Coastal Gas Link to go through. Well, and, and, and they're not even sure is, they want necessarily want the roads because these these, these roads are, yeah. are also have. I mean, when when they do environmental impact studies, mm -hmm. for one thing, one of the ways that these gas companies get away with uh, passing through these environmental. Uh, um, uh, impact studies is they only do an environmental impact of a short section of it at a time. They never look at the overall environmental impact, especially when you talk about the other infrastructure that has to go along with the pipelines. The other thing is, is uh, you know, getting back to the band councils, the band councils are offered money for this. Yeah, of I course, mean, and yeah. I don't mean just, I, I'm not saying that they put it in their pocket, but but they are offered funding for to allow these pipelines to go through. And so for, for, for some very short term monetary benefit, they they give something up that is essentially forever. Of course, it's forever. It will change. It will. It will change the landscape for forever, and it's not consensual. And, and industrialization is often seen as this like positive outlook, especially Progress. through colonial eyes. Exactly. And in fact, it's it's not. It's and in no way do they have to consent to have this industrial corridor exists with on, uh, within their land, within their right. Um, but just to, to kind of hop back to the timeline so folks know what's going on, uh, in 2019, in December, so just a couple months ago, um, the hereditary chiefs and the matriarchs evicted Coastal Gas Link. Uh, they handed uh, paperwork saying, you know, get off, get off the land, and Coastal Gas Link left. But from January onward, so January 2020 to now, well, not till now, but till, um, uh, uh, later in January, there was this fear, and uh, it was mostly just waiting for the RCMP to return to continue the injunction to push through the barricades um, along the main access road into Wet'suwet'en territory. And that came. Um, the RCMP came and violently uh, ripped down the blockades, uh, arrested a number of people at the different checkpoints, including the 44 and the Giddentum checkpoint and um, heading into Unistoten. So it's been a violent upheaval from January into February. And now in solidarity, we have these blockades popping up all over so-called Canada in order to withhold um, the infrastructure that is needed to build the pipelines as well as to call uh, accountability to, to Canada. And of course, since Canada is so nice, <laughs> you have to assume that the uh, that the overwhelming opinion of the American po or the Canadian population is open condemnation of what the Canadian government is doing. No, that's not what's happening. Absolutely what's happening not. is some of the most racist um, threatening. I mean, you, you want to talk about white supremacy and KKK? I mean, some of the stuff, um, it doesn't matter where in social media go, you, you go, you're going to find plenty of people t referring to Native people as animals and that they should be, you know, just shot and killed, let the trains run them over. I mean, all, all kinds of stuff. I mean, some of the most racist stuff you'll ever hear. And, and it's not just 
the fringe that's doing it. I mean, and this is where, you know, and, and why I think it's important that people realize that the amount of racism that Native people experience, that's why we have missing and murdered Indigenous women. Absolutely. That's why we have um, a, a, an incredibly disproportionate uh, prison population on the Canadian side. You know, look, going back again, uh, although I'm not going to get into a lot of details about the Oka crisis or the Gunnazadage crisis, we had an entire town called Shadagay mm. that lined up on the road to just stone and smash every car that tried to get out of Gunawage when the military was coming in. And, you know, uh, one person died of a heart attack sitting right in his car because, uh, because bricks had come through his window. I mean, they were burning effigies. They were rioting in the streets because there wasn't enough violence being perpetrated by the Canadian government and the RCMP uh, against, uh, against Native territories. Mm -hmm. And it is, this is what people uh, are completely oblivious to. No, absolutely. I think that what what for me is so concerning is that there is a media blackout and therefore so many people do not know other than within our indigenous, you know, within our cohorts, our groups, our communities, our nations. And when I speak to, you know, you, you know, whoever, especially in Brooklyn about this, most people have no idea that this is actual genocide happening. Um, we can see it it's, as as you brought up earlier, the um, UN Declaration of uh, Indigenous the rights of indigenous people um, states that removing people from their land is genocide. So this is genocide. And we cannot forget that the Wet'suwet'en matriarchs were invited to the UN last year to speak on this issue. And the UN, you know, took their photo ops, uh, said they would support. And now when the actual violence is coming, crickets. Where well, is and, the UN? And Justin Trudeau, um, the last time he was at the UN, uh, made overtures about how he was going to um, make sure that the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples became part of Canadian law and that mm -hmm. he was going to be uh, abiding by this minimum standard for the rights uh, of Indigenous people uh, necessary for the the survival, dignity, and well-being of Indigenous people. That's why it's, it's listed in the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. He, he swore that he would do that. And of course, this he now stands in stark violation, even as Canada is still trying to get themselves a seat as, as, um, in, in the Security Council. BC, British Columbia, they actually did pass legislation that that put that made the UN Declaration uh, on the Rights of Indigenous People a part of their law. It's, it's actually part. It's been legislated to be something that you can cite in, in a court case. I mean, and the reason I say that here in the United States, if we bring up the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, any court, from state to federal, will just say, "Well, we're not bound by that." Yeah, that's just theory. Yeah, well, yeah, it's it, it's <laughs> it's you know stuff that we we aspire to that. It's you know, but they they can just absolutely reject it out of hand. British Columbia actually incorporated it; they encoded it into their into their law, and they still stand in violation of it. So I think this is all part of the stuff that I think that people have to have to be aware of. Hey, look, we're, we're almost about an hour, so we're going to go to a break in a second. But I, I do want to remind people that we are. In fun drive. Mode. Always in fun drive. We're in fun drive mode. Well, we are. And essentially, and that's why I'm, on every show, whether we're in fun drive mode or not, I'm I'm always going to pitch that people make a donation to uh, to WBAI. Our event tonight is, uh, it, you know, we, we put out a box and we, we raised $250 last time. Uh, and we'll, uh, and we'll, we'll do it again, uh, do it again tonight. Um, you can go to the pledge line. You can go to 516-620-3602. You can make a, a one-time donation or you can become a, a BAI buddy in the name of this show. And I gotta say, we just—I just saw the list came out, and uh, and let's talk native is the has more WBI buddies than any other one day program, and we're only on once a week. You know, the other programs that have more than us are, are on five days a week. Um, man, I'd like to—I'd like to compete directly with those guys. I want to get us up to 60, 60 or ninety. Hey. So that's that's what I'm pushing for. We're, we're, you know, we're we're right around forty right now, but uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to see more people um, come out and uh, come to our events, uh, uh, you know, participate in what we do, but, but also become uh, buddies of the program. And again, that means that you are a sustainable member of uh, of w WBAI. That you give up your credit card information or your uh, or your checking account information, and you agree to a monthly donation. I don't what. Ten dollars a month. I mean, a hundred dollars a month. Whatever you can, whatever you can swing, but that allows us to to budget and plan in ways that um, um, that that the single donations 
you know, are, are great and we appreciate them, but we never know when the next one's coming. This way, it, it allows us to plan around it. So uh, if you become a WBI buddy in the name of Let's Talk, I would greatly appreciate it. And uh, and it does a lot for the a lot for the station. So again, 516-620-3602. That's the number to, to call to make a donation or become a WBI buddy. Hey, we're, we'll send you a tote bag and you might need those now. You because, will need yeah. them. March 1st. It's uh, over. No well, more plastic I guess, bags. No, you can carry all your groceries on your, on your, on your arms, I guess. <laughs> um, but that tote bag might come in handy. So, uh, you know, <laughs> that, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> so, uh, so anyway, uh, by all means, uh, make a donation, support WBAI. We are always in, uh, in, a, in a bit of a crisis mode. And, and you guys have been, you know, hearing some of what we've been going through since last fall. Um, and we're we're always trying trying to recover, and we're always trying to improve the product. So you know, this this enables us to do more. We're we're in our new studio overlooking Atlantic Avenue, something that we've been, been working towards for you know for most of a year, yeah. and uh, and here we are. So um, look, make a donation, support what we're doing, and uh, allow us to continue uh, continue some of the the great programming. You can also go online, by the way. You can go to www.give2wbai.org. That's G-I-V-E, the number two, WBAI.org. And uh, you can follow the prompts to, you know, again, become a buddy, make a donation. You can even follow the prompts. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll show you how to how to make a text donation. So you can even do that. So, um, all right, we'll, we'll take a break here. We'll go out on, a, on another Murray Porter song and we'll come back. We are going to, uh, I want to fill in more of what's, what's been happening up, uh, up there. And then, of course, in hour two, we are going to go to your call. So uh, so stand by and, and hang on for that. I look forward to that. Every, every time we're off for a couple of weeks, I always um, really look, uh, this is part of the, uh, that I missed back home. I actually had some people trying to call into my show back home, and I you can't call into my show back home. This is the only show you can do that. So uh, <laughs> so anyway, we'll take a break and we'll be right back. This is John King. Who's <laughs> rigging the logins? We'll be right back. All right, thanks for coming back. This is John Kane with uh, with rigging the logins. We uh, look. We're we're trying to uh, um, press on this story a little bit because there's nobody else doing it. Mm -hmm. And you know, we were talking during the break. The thing is. There's a lot of attention given to the Mexican border and very little given to the Canadian border. And, and in spite of the fact that the, the so-called alleged, uh, uh, you know, bombers or whatever you want to call them, the 9-11 conspirators all came across the Canadian border. But uh, we're, we won't talk about that. But here's the thing. <laughs> the, the, the Mexican border is viewed by Americans as a border between white and brown people. Absolutely. And, and the Canadian border is, well, it's just a port of entry for other white folks and of course neither one of those th those statements are really true but, of but that's the way the perception you know mexico is blocking brown people from coming in and the canadian border is welcoming white people to come in back and forth because those white people come and they shop and then they go back home one is safe and secure and white and one is a threat and that's not the reality you know borders are not obviously they're imaginary lines and there's <laughs> plenty of there's plenty of drugs and contraband that come across the canadian border and, and all kinds of other stuff i mean uh, and, and there's no question about that but you know from a native standpoint those borders both the the mexican and the canadian border were were we don't cross borders they crossed us is Absolutely. the line that we use i mean those things have been put through our territories mohawk territories in particular i mean most people associate um, Mohawks or uh, Gunyongeha as you know the eastern door of the Haudenosaunee, but but here's the reality: the vast and overwhelming majority of Mohawks live on the Canadian side. Why? Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> because that's where where most of my people were driven, and and and, and not just driven, but. Canada, or, or I'm sorry, England made promises to the Mohawks for uh, for being allies of theirs you know, against the French, against the uh, against the American colonists. Um, they they made promises to uh, to secure lands for uh, for their allies, not to make us part of of Canada, not to make us part of them, not to subjugate us, but uh, but they made promises, and that's why the you know one of the largest. You know, from a population standpoint, um, what they call reserves in Canada is Oswego, or, or called Grand River or Six Nations, and uh, and it has you know all six of the of the Haudenosaunee nations who who reside there, and that's um, that's 
you know, just just across the, you know, n- not far from Buffalo, put it that way, but mm-hmm. it's in, it's in Ontario. And then, of course, you have these other other communities like there's one called Wata, there's a Tendenego, which is where the, one of these rail blockades is going on. There's there's Aquasasne, there's Gunawage, there's Gunazadage. There's a, there's a, there's nine communities altogether. But um, and in mo- most of these communities, uh, our people have stood up in solidarity with what was happening in in uh, Wet'suwet'en territory, and in solidarity against um this expansion of fossil fuels development on native territories in general pipelines and and the like so that's what's been that's what's been going on and 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 you know you you kind you you refer to it i refer to it as a bit of a media blackout and it's really what it is there's and it's almost like not only does the american media not want to give it any attention uh canada's fine with that too they don't want it to, to have any attention down here and here's the thing our issues I don't distinguish myself from, uh, I mean, my family's from from Gunawage, so I don't distinguish um, Mohawks on the Canadian side from Mohawks on the American side. In fact, we refer to that as an imaginary line. Absolutely. Not even even as a, as a border. So the the issues that we face on the U.S. side are the exact same issues we face on the, the Canadian side. And frankly, all of these battles that have been going on, whether it's here in New York over the, over the Williams Pipeline or whether it's Dakota Access Pipeline or, or Keystone XL Pipeline, mm-hmm. these are the same battles that we're having on the Canadian side. And it even goes be, before this, be, because before they were doing all those, this, I don't know if you recall, but they were flooding out areas. Somebody told me once it was this, almost the size of France that, that Quebec had, had flooded out lands mm-hmm. to produce hydroelectric power. And guess who they sell it to, folks? Yeah, the United States. Of course. So they, so this idea of appropriating native lands and resources to to generate income for the Canadian government, for you know, for uh, you know, the power brokers, and I mean literally a power in terms of utilities. I mean, th- this has been going on for a very long time. So uh, you know, again, if, if, for you in the in the New York listening audience and those who are listening around the world uh, on uh, online. It is really important that you understand why we are talking about this. This is not something that is op- happening on another planet. And and these Canadian folks, they're just like American folks, uh, for better and worse, <laughs> as yeah, that absolutely. goes. So I think it's really important that people understand um, that even if it is, quote unquote, in another country, for us, it's not. It's also not because, uh, I mean, the Bayou Bridge Pipeline, which goes through um, uh my people's lands, Chukton, Chickasaw land in Louisiana was completed in 2019 after, um, you know, years of people being on the front lines and being pushed out of the bayou. And that, the Bayou Bridge Pipeline uh, does lead north and connects to the pipeline that will lead into uh, Wet'suwet'en territory. So it's, these are, they're connected. It's not as if, oh, this has nothing to do with us. We just failed. Um, we failed our our stewards of the land on this side of the border. Yeah. And I mean, now and, it is just moving further north. Keystone XL pipeline is about connecting, you know, uh, tar sands oil, this mm-hmm. bitumen, uh, trying to, again, help Canada export their, uh, the, this, this oil. And it's not even, they don't actually call it oil. They call it bitumen. It's a, uh, it's tar that is separated from sand and then diluted chemically so it can flow. And then they put it in a pipeline. And that's what this Keystone XL pipeline was about. These, um, this Balkan crude isn't just North Dakota. It's coming from the Canadian side mm-hmm. as well. And when we refer to the black snake, we're oftentimes not just talking about pipelines. We're talking about rail lines and we're talking about bomb trains. One of the largest explosions that ever occurred uh, on a a train derailment was um, was in in Quebec. And it was one of these bomb trains carrying Balkan crude, which is very, very volatile. Um, uh, For for life, I can't remember the name of the town, but I'll remember it. Um, But it it, it derailed uh, in Quebec and it, it, it literally wiped out an entire town. Uh, you know, killed, you know, I mean, uh, and you know, not a big town, but it's still, I mean, it, it wiped out a town. It, um, it, it, I think it, it killed like 56 people. And, and of course left this, you know, a whole bunch of contamination. Those same bomb trains, they come um, across New York. They, they come across New York through Seneca territory mm-hmm. where the CSX tracks cross through the Cattaraugus territory. They come 
uh, eastbound, they turn in Albany, and as I'm taking the Amtrak into um, uh, here each week, I'm either right alongside them as we're heading uh, heading east, but then once we get to uh, get to Albany, the CSX tracks run on the west side of the Hudson River while the Amtrak train or, or lines run on the east side. So as I'm going down, I can look across the river and see see these bomb trains. And so they're right there at the Hudson River. I mean, so this stuff, it's all connected, folks. You you can't separate whatever you know, issues people have on fossil fuels on the U.S. side with what, what's happening on the Canadian side. And the other argument that, that, that we oftentimes hear is the idea that, well, natural gas now, that burns cleaner. Well, it burns cleaner, but it's it's also still a has a terrible footprint in terms of extraction and distribution. It's still by some estimates, it it is the it, it may be be causing more greenhouse gases than um than than, than the burning of gasoline. Because it's still of a violation release. of the land. Well, it's and, a viol- it, who- and it's still. Um, continues the addiction to fossil fuels. Absolutely. And I also think that a lot of folks are like, oh, this is happening in Canada. Oh, it's happening. It happened in Dakota. Oh, it happened in Bayou Bridge. It's also, inc- I think people who are listening to this, um, who are local need to understand that there is a pipeline being built right now through Bushwick. It's mm-hmm. called the BK, BK pipeline. It is being pushed through by national grid. It is bringing in fracked liquid gas. It will be going right in front of two public schools. Yeah. Um, it is, uh, it started being built last year. It's supposed to be uh, be done. Um, the construction was supposed to be completed in 2020 in the fall. And National Grid did not do any environmental surveys and just pushed through. And again, this is a pipeline that is going through Bushwick, which is just north of here, is going through and is for export. It is in no way going to be accessible to the communities. Actually, National Grid has been withholding uh, gas from the black and brown communities in Bushwick in order to force people to accept this pipeline going Yeah, claiming through. That, that they need this to to, uh, to you know to reach everybody. And, and it's course- not true. It's not true at all. And Liberty Construction, which I'm going to hold accountable, which is based out of Coney Island, is the one who's providing the actual links to the pipeline. And if you walk down... Um, Manhattan Ave in Bushwick, you can see the literal pieces of the pipeline right there. Liberty Construction is con- is Don't you has love the names? Uh, Liberty, Liberty Construction, Pilgrim Pipeline, Constitution. I mean, these are these are literally the words, the names they give these things, and it's like, uh, you know, it's uh, it's like Patriot Act. <laughs> and if you and if you are if you want to learn more about this, um, we'll be hosting a town hall meeting on uh, March twenty seventh at Mayday Space in Bushwick. In order, it'll be by bilingual in Spanish and in English in order to inform the community and to begin a, a, a larger grassroots um, action against those who will be benefiting from the pipeline and to hold National Grid accountable and uh, to kill the black snake here in Bushwick. This is happening in Brooklyn right now, under your literally under your feet. Well, and, and again, I want to uh, remind people that tonight uh, we're hosting, this is my, you know, the, the monthly event that Let's Talk usually does. Uh, uh, we usually do on the last Thursday of, of every month, so that's that's tomorrow or that's today. I mean, so we're go- uh, t- tonight at seven thirty, we're going to be showing the film Invasion. And now this is a short film. This isn't a full length film like uh, like I usually do. This is a short one. Yeah. But we're going to also bolster that information. I do have some video of the House of Commons uh, testimony, and 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 Regan and I are going to just generally uh, uh, talk about what's been going on because this film, while it's powerful. It basically tells the the ten year story that doesn't even bring us to date. So we're gonna yeah. we're gonna bring that story to date um, with 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 what we know. We'll do uh, we'll do some Q and A's uh, in general. Uh, but I've also we can also pull some video clips up. Uh, uh, this is what we hope to present to you tonight. So we're hoping you're gonna come out. Uh, it is a WBAI event. Uh, I know Reggie and uh, other producers have been show, uh, playing the the cart that I've produced for this. Um, <laughs> so uh, again, join us. I will remind people today that next month my my March event is going to be I think it's on the nineteenth. It's it's the third week of March because there was a scheduling conflict. So um, so it will be the third week of uh, third Thursday. Is it twentieth to thirty? Is it the 19th? The 19th. 19th, okay. Uh, right. Also, just to, just to uh, plug Invasion, um, uh, when it, so the, Una Stoughton has a, a, a really great um, 
which is a, a village within Wet'suwet'en, uh, has a really great online present presence. And part of this part of it was the creation of um, this film Invasion, which they have specifically asked people to hold screenings for to um, inform the public about what is happening. So not only will you be watching a, a great a film that's indigenous uh, produced, led, made, everything like that, but also it has been asked by the hereditary chiefs, by the matriarchs, and by the community there that you watch this uh that you watch this film it is available on youtube if you cannot join us just google uh, or check in youtube invasion in all caps and it will be the first um film that pops up it's about 20 minutes long um and if you are interested in becoming more involved with this please go to the unistoten toolkit um just google that online and it'll show you how you can watch the film also donate to the um the different checkpoints along the way and uh how you can become more involved in you know, getting it out there. That's what we need. We keep saying all eyes on Wet'suwet'en because that's what we need. We need everyone paying attention to what's happening there. Well, and um, and, and again, when other communities, including these Mohawk communities, stepped up in solidarity, uh, one of the things that, that folks like Andrew Scheer, the, the conservative party leader in Canada, tried to say was, oh, these are just a, a, a group of rogue activists that, uh, that are, that, whose only uh, thing you know, objective is to, is to harm Canada and to destroy the um, the fossil fuels industry, the, the oil and gas industry of Canada. Um, honestly, we haven't, we're not shooting that high <laughs> at this point, for the most part. And I'm going to speak as, as a Mohawk. We're trying to stop this pipeline from going through Wet'suwet'en territory at this point. Uh, you know, I think everybody should have in their, in their, long-term goals you know some some level of weaning or elimination of the fossil fuels industry but but canada is trying to make this sound like this is just a, a war against it by and they, he stopped short of calling, calling it um my these are my friends terrorists mm. but uh just barely stopped short but uh, just to to put a, a um a finer point on the relationship between Wet'suwet'en territory and and our communities uh a group of the Wet'suwet'en uh, traditional chiefs including some of the folks uh, that are in this film yep um came out to Tandenega they sat with the folks in Tandenega they held a couple of press conferences they went out to Gunnazadag or I mean the Gunnawage as well which is where I'm from um and they met with the longhouse people there and you know, and frankly even the band councils you know who are oftentimes you know, the, the ones that I worry about selling us out, they have been st uh, standing in support. And in fact, as these blockades have happened, not only in, uh, in Tandenega, but as I said, highways, um, you know, uh, bridges, uh, on the, in Gunawage, uh, the, the police force is called the SQ, the Surrette de Quebec. Mm -hmm. And they, um, uh, they are the ones who, who basically wage war against, uh, um, my people in, in 1990 in the Oka crisis, uh, they have tried to to push back against the blockades that have been, because they're blocking rail again. But but even this rail was done illegally as it went through Mohawk territory. So, and that can't be impressed upon enough. And uh, so again, the Wet'suwet'en chiefs and uh, and and some of the the uh, the, the real. Um, uh, prominent women who were involved in this came out and they visited uh, um, those two Mohawk territories. They basically made it very clear in, in their in their message to Justin Trudeau and, and the Canadian government, we'll take the blockades down, but you need to pull your folks out, out of, of out of what's all And and not just not just back the RCMP up. He, and and. And it was the Wet'suwet'en chiefs in particular said, "No, we need the trailers. We need all of that. The, those um, uh, military, all that military equipment taken out. We want you to stop, you know, patrolling our lands, and we want you to stop." facilitating uh, the CGNL, uh, the, the pipeline folks. And, and destroying their trap lines in the process. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's it, there's this isn't just damage that might happen if there's an incident with a pipeline. This is damage that happens it's just, frankly, with, with, with the cops being there and, and, uh, and providing the, the level of, of traffic and, uh, and, and people who are normally not in, the, in these places. This is, these are pretty remote areas that are pretty pristine until you start, you know, filling, you know, uh, you know, tens or up to, you know, or a hundred, uh, you know, police, uh, um, uh, policemen and, uh, SWAT, uh, SWAT agents and, uh, and, and pipeline personnel. This is, this is what our territories have been experiencing. And, and it's, it really is, it, it's a level of, of absurdity. And so, uh, 
because when you hear somebody like Justin Trudeau saying, well, you know, we we backed up the uh, the RCMP and they didn't open up the blockades and uh, now we got to stop. You, you got to stop what you're doing. We're coming in. <laughs> and, you know, and what he said was so disingenuous. I mean, it's it, not just no, I'm being nice. It was a lie. And and this is the thing that that and I've I've said it here on the program many times. The problem that we as native people face, it isn't just that we have um, uh, the conservatives that that we're, are working against us. It's the liberals too. Yeah. I, you know, I say it all the time. Race, the general... Racism isn't a right thing; it's a white thing, and that's and I, and I know folks get and you know they get trouble every time I bring race into the issue, but it is what it is. And there's just no way around the conversation. Well, I think that's also true here with bipartisan politics yeah. um, on this side of the so-called border is people are like, oh, Democrats, oh, they're liberal. I mean, d Democratic state, the Republican state, these are all uh, settler colonial politics. In the end, they don't have our best interests in mind, um, nor are they intending to. They're there to maintain the settler colonial state as it stands, which has no place and is no place for indigenous people to thrive and survive, as well as for um, those who are the descendants of chattel slavery. So it's 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 specific to um, I, I think it's so interesting, especially considering like the the. Uh, uh, the election coming up and people are watching all these like Democratic Oh, even the primary, debates. especially in, in South Carolina. Oh, I, I saw some great stuff by Mike, Michael Harriet again. He said, can we stop reducing, you know, pursuing the black vote to just issues of poverty and uh, in prisons? I mean, the, the, the idea that these white people are all framing the black problem as one of poverty and prisons it just shows you the lens that, that that they have as they're as they're viewing this. I also before we before I mean I feel like we could talk about the yeah dark, we can go everywhere. But I do want to say something that is uh, really important because it has to do with the um, with the. Um, with Mohawk Solidarity is that CBC News released an article yesterday, uh, February 26th, um, and it says uh, Quebec premiers claim that protesters have AK-47s at blockade, reckless, uh, which is then uh, in. Uh, Subtitle is Reckless, says Mohawk Council of Kanaweka, which is like, we need to talk about that. First of all, it's a lie. Um, but you know what? Even if it's true, in the, you know, there's nobody's suggesting that there's illegal guns. I mean, and, oh, and, no. and, and frankly, it, why shouldn't Mohawks be armed if, uh, if, they're, if they're being faced off? I mean, look, I go back to the Oka crisis. And our guys were armed and their guys were armed. And you know what? That's not where most of the, sh the shooting took place. I mean, but it balances the scales. When I hear people say that, well, you know, these blockades, those are not very peaceful. And, uh, no, I'm and, not and trying to be peaceful, y'all. Well, <laughs> okay. you know, I, I get into the definition of, of the word, um, our word, which is skana. And some people say it means peace. Well, not peace in the sense that it's the absence of conflict. It is about a process to restore balance, to restore harmony. Well, look, if you're doing something bad to somebody, we can't just say you're wrong and pray about it. If we don't tip the scales a little, if we don't add some weight to some issue like blocking a railway, then we have no way to balance this thing out. Yeah. And, and you know, and, and although there's no evidence to suggest that um, that the Mohawk warriors are, are armed with automatic weapons, <laughs> Even if they were, no, then don't shoot anybody and you won't get shot back at, is my view. I mean, I mean it, it's kind of like, you know, when California passed all of its its real harsh gun laws, it was because black people were starting to arm themselves. Course, that's why they that's did that. That's when people care about gun laws. I also should clarify that I am in no way anti, uh, I believe that indigenous people and black folks should be arming ourselves um, and that there is a, a resistance coming that will um, need that kind of uh, training. So I think I the should... NRA is really supporting the Mohawks being armed. Oh, I bet, pretend, <laughs> at least they'll pretend to get to get the money out of it. Um, it those registration fees. But no, uh, you make a good point. But though. I just I wanted yeah. to bring that up because that is now where the narrative is going, which is where the narrative was going after FTP here in New York, and is where the narrative went during uh, No Dapple. And it's always the narrative, which is that when uh, specifically Indigenous and Black folks, we begin to um, we've always been organized, but when we become more overtly organized organized and are blocking railways or causing um, subway close uh, sh uh, shutdowns when when those are the things that 
uh, inconvenience white people and capitalism, that's when you start to see the narrative shift that we are, in fact, armed and ready to kill. And, and to be clear, when the RCMP went into into these places, they brought snipers. Absolutely. And, and there have been the red dots that showed up on our people as they were standing there, both in Wet'suwet'en territory and in, uh, in Tandanego. So so anybody who, who thinks, you know, that it would, be, it would be so wrong if the Mohawks armed themselves, I don't. I'm sorry. No, I just not don't. at all. I think also when uh, when the RCMP went back into uh, Wet'suwet'en territory, um, a article was released in which they were told uh, to shoot to kill um, and to aim for the head. So these are not – this isn't a nonviolent – this isn't – this is just violence perpetuated. But when we look at violence from the RCMP, um, it's somehow excused. Well, and, and again, to those friends and, – and I just had somebody post just the other day. They said if Trump is reelected, they're moving to Canada. I said – you know, for one thing, okay. no white man's gonna tra uh, gonna chase me out of my territory, out of my home, where I live. Anyway, Trump or anybody else, but <clears throat> but the racism on the Canadian side is every bit as bad, if not worse, towards Native people, of and, and I can't emphasize that enough. And so, <clears throat> when I hear people say that, and they and then they say, "Well, at least they're not gonna be uh, shot with rubber bullets when they block a train." No, but people ran through a guy, a guy drove through a crowd in one of these at one of these yes. protests already. Y yep. And so, don't suggest to me that that that's not gonna happen. I mean, and <laughs> all of that, those rubber bullets and the and the and the concussion grenades and all that other stuff. Sorry to bust your bubble, but that was during the Obama administration. Oh. That was Obama who was the president then. In fact, the Dakota Access Pipeline was built during the Obama administration. It was proposed and built during the Obama, the Obama administration. This isn't just something that kind of glided through his administration for eight years. No, this was a brain trust of, uh, of the Obama administration. And in fact, Hillary Clinton would refer to these pipelines as federal infrastructure projects that she was very supportive of, oh. which is one of the reasons Hillary. you know I couldn't help take my view and my the opinion that I had of uh, Hillary Clinton in the way that I did. I also so. think it's important that we note something about rubber bullets and tear gas and all these things is that they come from a company. Uh, most of them are, um, come from a company called Safari Land. Uh, Safari Land, though, is a tactical gear um, – is a tactical gear Don't tell shop. me Bloomberg owns it. No, Warren Canders does. Oh. Um, who, um, who? if anyone knows anything about Warren Canders, he lives here in New York City. Um, we're not a big fan of him. And he sits on the board at Brown University as well. And he was sitting on the board at the Whitney Museum. And oh. that was a number of, uh, last year we held a number of direct actions specifically led by a decolonized place in order to ask for his removal from the board, which he did. Um, I mean, mind you, what does that mean? His money is still going into many yeah. institutions in New York. But I just want um, New Yorkers to know that uh, Warren Kenders is based locally. You can look his face up online. Um, maybe when you see him, throw a coffee at him. Um, but also be aware that... Don't make, don't make it too hot. We don't yeah, want to hurt anybody. Don't too yeah. hot. Yeah, just an ice... I mean, we're New Yorkers. We like just iced coffee. Just him. Um, uh, but uh, Warren Kenders is here based locally. He's still on a number of boards. He still provides a lot of money. He uh, owns Safari Land. Safari Land also weaponizes, militarily weaponizes the NYPD. Safari Land, that sounds like a fun place. Though. Right, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, All right. Hey, hey, we're at the top of the hour. So uh, before we go, let me again remind people that we are in fun drive mode. You can go to our, our pledge line, which is 516-620-3602. Make a donation of any size. Look, it supports programs like this. You're going to hear, I know, I know that you are hearing stuff from Regan and I that you haven't heard anyplace else. So this is what WBI brings. It's why we ask you to support the station, why we ask you to support the show. So go to the pledge line, 516-620-3602. Make a donation of any size. Become a Let's Talk WBAI buddy. I'd greatly appreciate that. I'd like to get those numbers up. I'd, I'd love to have 60 or, or 90. I want to I, I have as many buddies as the, as the five-day-a-week shows have. That's what I want to do. So, so uh, step up. Um, do, 10 bucks a, do 10 bucks a month. That would, that would be great. I mean, it's it's not a lot. Uh, you're spending that much money um, throwing coffee at uh, Mr. Canders. Uh, Mr. Canders. So. <laughs> so. I'm going to get in so much trouble. Uh, anyway. uh, no, do, <laughs> do support WBAI. Again, the, the website is www.give2, that's number two, WBAI.org, or you can go to the pledge line, 516-620-3602, and make a donation there. This is John This and Regan. We'll take a break here, and we'll be right back with your call when we come back all right we got our headphones on 
that means, <laughs> that means that means we're ready to, to buckle in for some phone calls. And you know, br- bring them on, folks. I really do want to hear from you. The number to call is two one two two zero nine two eight seven seven. And you know what? I did have. I literally had somebody try to call me nine times while I was doing my show back home. Uh, and I when I, I only use my phone. I use literally use my cell phone to bring a guest on uh, on my uh, back home. I don't have a. I don't have a fancy phone system there. So um, look, if you were trying to call me for my Let's Talk Native show uh, and want to talk about something, there here's the number 212-209-2877. I'd love I love hearing from the from the listeners here in New York, but uh, I gotta admit when I get a call from Hawaii or I get a call from New Orleans or I get a call from Florida or from one of my uh, native communities, I I'm thrilled to death to hear those two. So, uh, all right, we're going to get right into... Oh, well, well, before we do, first, um, during the break, we talked about how how hard it is when you feel like you are solely responsible for information. Mm-hmm. I got to tell tell you, if you're interested in what we're talking about on the Canadian side, one of the um, the groups that's doing stuff up there is called Real People's Media. Yeah. And uh, and that's... Uh, um, one, of my, one of the guys is, is Mohawk. The other guy's non-native that's, uh, the, that are the principals in this. But if you go, they're, they're on Facebook. Book, but if you go to their website, Real People's Media, they've got a ton of videos. They are the ones who are predominantly responsible for all of the videos that are coming out of Tandanega um, and, and other places. So, um, And they're also on Instagram as well as Real People's Media, one word. Um, and just to plug another Instagram, it's Gidentum Checkpoint, which is G-I-D-I-M-T-E-N underscore Checkpoint. Now, um, we are doing our event tonight. Uh, we're going to show uh, Invasions. Invasion, it's a it's a short film. But I also have, uh, I brought on a thumb drive the video from the House of Commons. I, we may not go through all of it, but uh, there were there were four speakers there. There was Justin Trudeau, there was uh, Andrew Scheer, there was Jagmeet Singh, who is uh, the NDP oh, leader. Yes. Uh, um, not somebody you expect to see uh, be, because I think he's he's Hindu, um, I believe, or Sheikh, I, I don't know what I he is. I think he's Sikh. Sikh, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I actually reached out to him. I wanted him to join me on this show. Uh, I haven't heard back from him, but uh, but he he gave some testimony as well as one of the ministers from from BC. Uh, so we'll play some of that tonight as well. I think it's important to see the contrast that was coming from uh, this testimony in front of the House of Commons. And 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 again to demonstrate because I don't think people can imagine. Can you imagine a native issue? Getting this much attention in the in the U.S. Con- Congress, I mean, even Dapple didn't. Even oh uh, no, even when just, and it wasn't, and it really happening. wasn't until the whole situation with Democracy Now, filming with the whole dog situation, yeah, and, yeah. And, and and that's and and that was like closer to the end. Yeah, to absolutely. That. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and so to get to get the president of the United States, uh, I remember when, when Barack Obama weighed in on the mascot issue, and and I and here's what he said, and I'm going to paraphrase, but he said, if I had a team. And if that team had a name that a significant number of people found offensive, I think about changing it. Let that settle in for a second. Just think about because, it. Because <laughs> you know, what people said is, "Oh, Barack Obama weighed in and he said he changed it." No, right, he said, he'd he, think he about said it. if about three or four times, and uh, and he was very very noncommittal. But uh, uh, and and that's what everybody wants to twist around as being, "Oh yeah, he's been so supportive." But anyway, uh, <laughs> real people's media. Um, that's that's a place that you can get a lot of this information. So I'm I'm going to plug those guys a little bit down here. All right, we w- do want to go to the phone calls. So caller, you're up first. What's your name and where are you calling from? Yeah, hi, uh, John. This is Arnold from uh, Peekskill. Arnold, thanks for calling. How you doing? Um, I have family up in British Columbia. Really? Up in Vancouver, yeah. I have a cousin who's a member of the Canadian National Film Board. Mm-hmm. Her name is uh, Carolyn, Carolyn Green. Do you know if she's uh, covering any of this stuff? or, or do you think I she... spoke to her last week. She she's do this coverage. You know, she's a, a filmmaker. You know, she's sort of semi-retired, but she does... Uh, Okay, she's done documentaries about, you know, Yugoslavia over 20 years ago as well, and she uh, she covered the situation up in Oka. Uh, now, she, about, so what was the impression she gave you, uh, you know, from somebody non-native in Vancouver? Uh, well, she, this is just uh, you know a continuous struggle that's going on, mm. and it's acknowledging you know she acknowledges you know how deeply rooted you know racism and the treatment of the First Nations up in Canada. Mm-hmm. And also another thing, um, there's, a, there's a media co-op uh, up in uh, Vancouver. Media, it's called uh, media co-op dot, dot ca. I think dot com. Mm-hmm. 
Well, uh, there's also uh, on the on the Canadian side, there's the APTN. It's Aboriginal People's Television Network. Um, yeah. And 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 again, sometimes I don't think they go quite as. Uh, they certainly are not the the BET of, <laughs> of Canadian television. No, 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 television, no, 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 no. They're because not. Because they try they're to not. stay pretty mainstream, but uh, um, but they're you know, I, and I'm I'm not saying the media is uh, is. You know, skewing it terribly, but I am. But uh, well, no. I mean, uh, compared to the U.S. side, I think there, there's probably a little bit more fairness. But the problem is, the vast majority of Canadians are very, very racist at their core. And I'm not yep. saying we don't have allies, and we certainly do. But uh, you know, because every time you see one of these media outlets post something, if you go to any place that has comments to it, it's it's deplorable. I mean, it's amazing. There were actually. Um, in fact, I want to suggest that it was a newspaper out of Winnipeg, I think it was, during the Idle No More movement that yeah. literally shut down their forum. Because anytime they covered any of the Idle No More stuff, they said the amount of racist you know, commentary and the vitriol mm -hmm. that was coming on. The, so they literally, as a newspaper, who you would think they would pride themselves on having some ability to, you know, to be interactive, they literally had shut down their, <laughs> um, um, their, their forums because it was just too filled with racism. Right, just amazing. Yeah, so it's like it's ongoing struggle up in Canada and and up here in, in the states. We hear very little, if if anything at all. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, anyway, Reagan, welcome, welcome. Oh, thanks. To, uh, yeah, I'm Arnold, but I just let you know. And, and Arnold's a regular, so I think I thank you for for you joining. Know, I've been us. a volunteer <laughs> on and off at over 30 years at BA. Oh, well, we appreciate that as well. We sure do. Yeah. All right, thanks, okay. Arnold. All right, again, the number is two one two two zero nine two eight seven seven. Do we got another one coming up there? Okay, all right, we'll go to another caller right now. Caller, you're up next. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Peter from Tampa. Peter. Yeah. All right. Yeah, uh, I don't know. This is kind of off topic, but it gives it a different perspective. Do you remember in the year two? I don't know if you covered twenty uh, thirteen. Like a, a 75 car freight train blew up in this in eastern Ontario. Uh, it was actually in it was actually in, Qu was actually in Qu Quebec, and for and I still can't, can Quebec. you look that up with the with the name of the town? Uh, for some reason, I can't think of the name, but. The guy forgot to put the brakes on. Yeah, they you came know, came you know, into a town hot, and they and they were it was a bomb, it was what we call bomb trains because it was carrying this uh, Balkan crude, and right, some right. of that stuff is coming from the United States. By the way, it's not all um, uh, um, it's not just fracked on the uh, on the Canadian side, but a lot of this is coming from North Dakota in that area in that Balkan region, which does go across. Um, uh, what's what's it called? Uh, it was called. Oh, Lac Megantac. Uh, yes, Lac Megantac. <laughs> yeah. yes. Lac Megantac. That's what it was. Yes. Yeah. It kind, of, it kind of expands the subject, but it kind of like if anyone wants to say, "Oh, these crazy protesters, they're exaggerating the danger." Of course, they're not exact. Some guy forgets to put the brakes on, and the town blows up. And it's not Indians; it's everyone who's at risk. Well, Black and, and that's the crazy over. part. Even even the, the those same bomb trains essentially come through through New York. Yeah. And they what CSX. Uh, basically said was well we will slow these trains down to 30 miles an hour anytime we cross through an area that is, uh, that is a population of over a hundred thousand people per so many acres or, or per square miles the problem is there's a lot of small towns along the way so you know if you don't have if you don't have so they'll slow down when they pull into Albany I guess and uh, but every place in between they're they're simply not going to slow down I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's, it's incredible. also not just about slowing down. Like, we don't need this. Like, we don't need fossil fuels. Like, we don't need them. And the fact that we continue, not we, I use we, you know, colloquially. Um, and the fact that they're still used and still transported is absurd because they are not necessary. Well, and these bomb trains are oftentimes taking this stuff, even the ones that come through New York and then down the Hudson to um, um, New Jersey and Philadelphia. It's going down there for export. I mean, so that's, again, this isn't about energy independence. Absolutely not. This is about raping the planet. And if anybody wants to do any uh, searching on what tar sands oil looks like up in, uh, in Alberta, what you'll see is a huge swaths of the boreal forest that have been cut down and destroyed so they could mine. They literally go in with trucks and dig up dirty tar sands i mean and, and it's exactly what it sounds like it, it's 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 sand that has tar in it and then they uh well this is one of the main uh, ways they do it they mine the sand and then they separate the oil from the sand one of the other ways they do it is they take natural gas and they superheat water and they 
pump the water underground to try to make the tar percolate to the top and and and, and uh, percolate through uh, through pipelines. So. And no matter how they do it, it is the filthiest and most disgusting and, and most ground destroying, land destroying, water destroying uh, process that you can imagine. It's just con continuously contaminating the land. Yeah. Yeah. Well, th uh, Peter, thanks for that. I, I know it was trying. I, I, all I saw when uh, uh, Reggie was pulling up the name, I saw Lack, and it, all of a sudden it reminded me what it was. Lack Magantech. Yeah, that was the name of the town. Uh, but yeah, we mentioned that earlier. So so thanks for, for bringing it up and making me, uh, forcing me to remember the name. <laughs> all right. Caller, you're up next. New one. Uh, caller, you're up next. What's your name? Where are you calling from? My name is Apone. I just wanted to harass Regan. <laughs> Hi, Apone. Hi, what's going on? You're uh... on the radio. You're <laughs> oh, oh girl the next time i see you i'll give it to you apone oh, is you. in uh is uh, is a member of the indigenous kinship collective which is the same collective uh, that i that i belong to and uh she's i'm not supposed to use these words but she's badass right. <laughs> oh, there you go uh, <laughs> well it's great I that you called call in wow <laughs> thank you because i didn't really realize you know what the station was and i realized it wasn't Probably not the station that was, you know, on the website because there was a lot of church music and was definitely a WBAI you know, FM ninety nine point five. You can, you know, uh, back home I had, to, I just, uh, you know, I, I can ask my smart, my smart speaker but that was i couldn't say that smart, smart speaker, speaker. <laughs> <laughs> i just say play wbai and it does it so uh so you can do that as well thanks for calling in upon i appreciate it oh you're so welcome so what's you know what's developing here what is you know are, are we able to stop this are we able to you know put a halt to what's pretty much going on here in in the in in relation to the brooklyn pipeline or in relation to the um the pipeline going through with Suedin. The pipeline going, well, I guess both, really. Well, I think that... You know, there was an issue with the trains. Um, I, I, you know, there's so much going on right now. Literally, it's, it's mind-boggling. I, I think I think we're kind of winning that battle, to be honest with you. Yeah. Because, you know, even when they went into Tandanega and they arrested uh, half a dozen people and roughed up some guys, all that did was spark even more, uh, uh, more blockades. More rail lines got uh, stopped. More highways got kids walked out of school so yeah. this is this is being driven by young people by uh, by you know just absolutely impressive and, and courageous women who are stepping up uh, in this thing and yeah, and, and of course we're all we're all together on this thing and and even you know some of the band count the elected councils that that i'm not a big fan of they're being brought along one of the guys they call him a grand chief which is kind of absurd but uh, in in Gunna Zadage, um he spoke out against the uh the, the blockades and then the people revolted against them and they uh, they wouldn't let him back in his office and so he wow. he came on and then he apologized and he said oh i should have listened more to my people yes yeah, good good thought um and so no i i think that we're we're we've actually got canada i mean they're saying they, they've lost over 100 million dollars in economic value which good. doesn't good. really bother me too much but uh um <laughs> With just the, I think that I think that when it comes to what's happening in in um, so-called Canada, it is this is just the brewing of the storm. You know, there is it like really is. there's so much there's resistance, so much going on. And you're right, Regan. And I'll be honest, I think this is a lot stronger than Standing Rock. I mean, oh yeah, when you, I was when, we were, yeah. when I was there, I'll tell you, girl, we had support, but it wasn't like that. Well, one of the things like that, that I suggested back during Standing Walk was that, was that everybody didn't need to go there. In fact, if there were more people wherever you lived that did a blockade, if you if you mm -hmm. if everybody stood up closer to home, you can still go home and eat dinner afterwards. You don't have to you, you don't have to show put ten thousand people in in a remote area. And one of the things about on the, on the Canadian side is, uh, and this has been. You know, even their own people have studied this. Their infrastructure is very, very vulnerable because they arrogantly push these railroad uh, tracks and these pipelines through our territory. So even oh, not just the new ones, but old ones. So if they if they want to maintain what they got, they uh, they better stop trying to push more through. Otherwise, we're going to tear that stuff up, too. And I would say that if you're interested in getting more involved, like, please follow um, our collective Instagram. And Apone can support me on this um, at the Indigenous Kinship Collective. Um, it's one word on Instagram. And the, the reason I bring that up is because... Um, she and I and, and other uh, members of our collective held space and did a sit-in at the UN um, uh, last week in order to hold them accountable for the lack of um, action being done. So I think that uh, I want to echo what um, 
uh, what's being said that we can't all go to Wet'suwet'en, nor is it appropriate for us to go to Wet'suwet'en in the same way that lots of people people went to Standing Rock. It is our we need to be uh, spreading uh, spreading the message and doing the work here in our local communities as well because. That is how we get support. I mean, it's if you got a local guy here who's funding, yeah. who's funding weaponry being used against protesters, you don't need to go go to Wet'suwet'en to uh, you know to, to stand up against that kind of stuff. You can stand up against you know politicians and banks. I mean, uh, it's like. Uh, uh, like Shawnee and, and her, her friend climbing the uh, the flagpoles yeah. uh, to hang a banner up down in front of uh, you know Chase, just so everyone Chase. knows J P Morgan and Chase is one of the largest funders for this pipeline so um, get prepared for uh, you know for the wrath for the indigenous wrath J P Morgan and Chase <laughs> hey and, and if you're a fan of NPR call them up and say why do you why are you sponsored by the Koch brothers uh, um, yeah. there, there you go that's there, there's another one so even you know the people who think that this is just you know this is always just a right wing thing look there are plenty of, of liberals again Hillary Clinton she was an advocate for these pipelines al although she used the euphemism she used to call these pipelines uh, federal infrastructure projects they're not federal infrastructure projects these are private highways that oil companies get to run their product through that's what they are so yes that's all it is and i 100 percent agree with you like if everyone goes to a suit and it, it's almost as if it's what you know the government wants because then you've got a weak point north south east and west you know if everybody participates you know like like the four directional prayer mm -hmm. are all strong up front they're not going to be able to stop it they're not going to be able to stop so many thousands of people but if everyone goes, you know, to a Suetan, then you know what's going to happen. It's also a burden gonna, on them. Yeah. Yes, it's going to be weak everywhere else. Yep. Yep. No, I, absolutely. And and so this is what you know. And this is ha this happened during the Oka crisis as well, where where Native communities. It just isn't done on the U.S. side the way it should be. I mean, and I that's agree. what we. This is the message that the success of what's happening on the Canadian side, <clears throat> Native people and you know and our allies, those people who who want to resist these projects, have to learn that you don't need to go to one specific site to do it. We all have some of this infrastructure that goes through, you know, or or the or the benefactors or. or or beneficiaries of some of this in our in our communities we can all take a step against the stuff no matter where we are at. especially here in new york city we are in the global capital of the world it is run by capitalism and a lot of the funders for these pipelines live within these boroughs mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much uh, for calling and supporting uh, our new co-host here. Thanks, Apone. I'll see you soon. <laughs> Bye. All right. We got another one on the line there. Well, let's give the number up again. It's 212-209-2877. 212-209-2877. Um, look, there's a, there's a lot of stuff happening, and we're we're trying to you know give you some information on the stuff that you're you're not familiar with. One of the things that I talked about on my uh, when I, I did the show last week, I just did it from home and I did it on Facebook. I wasn't on WBAI, but I did it anyway. Um, I did feel compelled to to remind people as Bloomberg was spending so much money in this democratic election, some of the <laughs> racist things that he had said towards native people, you know, considering that this guy, you know, I, I just heard now that he made some overture that he was going to do some things for native people. And I'm thinking, LOL. you know, some of the racist stuff that this guy was responsible for. He literally told David Patterson, uh, that he thought the greatest image would be for him to put on a cowboy hat and take a shotgun and stand up on the throughway. Uh, th so this is a white man telling a black man to arm himself, for wrong thing, which is kind of unusual. Um, uh, to arm himself with a shotgun. <laughs> blind black man, no less. Um, go up on the throughway and... Legally blind. Uh, legally blind, I'm sorry. <laughs> I guess he could still shoot something. Um, thank you. Uh, All folks, <laughs> let's not... I'm not picking up blind people here, but, but no. But the, let's the, not be ableist, y'all. Yeah, yeah. Everyone has the ability to participate. <laughs> So anyway, he tells David Patterson to stand up on the throughway where it crosses Seneca territory and tell the Senecas that he is the law of the land and that he is there to enforce the law of the land. I mean, failing to recognize that the section of throughway we're talking about, uh, it goes through Seneca territory. It's not part of New York State. It's not part of the United States. It was uh, it, it was allowed to go through through coercion and yeah. through through theft. But the, the land, and, and to be clear, the land that the throughway crosses is not um, New York State Highway. It is not purchased. It, it is an easement. 
it is an easement where the Senecas own the underlying uh, own own the land own the uh, own the title uh, and it's and it's absolute title. Getting back to even like the Woods Hole they were talking about, it's it's these are some of the things that, that people aren't aware of. But but this this battle that Bloomberg raged, you know, waged against um, Native people involved in tobacco and uh, and again the, his just insatiable appetite to tax tobacco ultimately would translate into uh, even into the death of Eric Gardner. Uh, in, in Staten Island, because the the, the alleged reason, and, and I say alleged because there was a lot of other stuff going on there, uh, he was harassed by by the New York City police um, over over selling individual Lucy's, cigarettes. Yeah, yeah. And also, let's not forget that Bloomberg is the mastermind of stop and frisk, yeah, which and literally put yeah, thousands um, of black folks, specifically young black men, into the jail system for carrying marijuana. And not by chance. He targeted black people. No, that was and, done and, and to, be, to be clear. On purpose. You know, so, uh, and so that's some of the stuff that I talked about last week. Uh, I thought we would get a chance to do it do it here, but we ended up changing some schedules around. But, uh, um, you know, maybe it's a moot point. If uh, if Bloomberg gets his, his, his ass kicked in South Carolina or in Super Tuesday, maybe uh, all his money can just... Um, I don't know. Go someplace else. It doesn't have to buy. Try to buy an election. Well, I guess we'll see. I guess we'll see. All right. Do we, anybody we else? Have a, we have a oh, couple yeah. of calls. Uh, let's take them. All right. Let's go. Uh, caller, caller, you're up next. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, my name is Chris. I'm calling from Long Island. Hey, Chris. Thanks for calling. Uh, I had a question. If you had any update on that, uh, the sign that the people were having a problem with out in Southampton, Long Island. Uh, I, I haven't. Oh few, yeah, sure. I haven't talked to uh, my my friend is Lance uh, Lance Gums. He's uh, one of the uh, the guys on, on council there, and uh, and he joined me. I, I do have to catch up with him. I know that they were still pushing forward, and I don't know what the latest on the on the court rulings have been, but uh, I know they have a sign that's up. I don't know if they if they finished the second one or not. Um, thanks for asking me that. I'll I'll check I'll check in with uh, with uh, with Lance, and and maybe I'll get him to jo to join us even perhaps even next week to because they had some other issues going on. They had some grave um uh site issues that were going on yeah, there as well um the the shinnecock hills um so uh the shinnecock hills there was a lot of construction happening on there and it's been happening there for you know quite some time um oh it was a golf course then it was condos and right golf now they're course. building condos and in the process mm -hmm. of bulldozing to build these condos um bones were um Discovered. Uh, were discovered and the desecration of the land has continued and the Shinnecock people have asked for the con for the ending of this so that they can <laughs> and, and they've been fighting since a lot of this this uh, the so-called progress for years. Uh, I know the the poor people's campaign has picked up some of this uh, and are, have been supporting the Shinnecock on this. Um, and so I know I, I talk, talked to some folks associated with that as well. But we also need to remember the Shinnecock um, uh, are. Uh, one of the closest the Shinnecock Reserve is the closest reserve here to to New York City, and also that a lot of the folks there are Afro Indigenous, and so are going to be erased from the narrative more so than uh, just Indigenous uh, uh, narratives. So this is not just anti-Native; it is also anti-Black uh, happening all at once in Long Island, and um, you know more to more information to be released as things change but in the end what we should be doing is asking for the end of construction on shinnecock hills it is sacred land and uh, the shinnecock have asked for uh construction to end without uh without any uh viable response from the localized government you know and and you you bring up a good point and and i think one of the things that that people can't quite really appreciate is the difficulty that 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 people like like the ramapo and and the shinnecock and even the the, the Puspatuck, what they experience in terms of having a double dose of racism heaped mm -hmm. upon them because they'll they'll actually have their native ancestry denied by uh by others and sometimes even absolutely. by other native groups as a matter yes, of fact which absolutely. is which is more even more concerning but but so when you when you've got this this history where your your ancestry ancestry has been mixed with the slave trade uh and, and that the whole chattel slavery thing and and now you become victimized even farther as you go through and you try to hang on and there's no reason to dismiss 
either part of that heritage. Absolutely. But the idea that, that you can be persecuted almost doubly because of it, it's, that's a whole other story. And, and I know that I've had some callers who called about that, and that's a, that's a show we need to do. And um, maybe Absolutely. we'll pull some people in to do that. So I want to thank uh, Chris for calling in. I, I greatly appreciate it. Um, all right, let me go to another caller. Caller, you're up next. What's your name? Where are you calling from? We got you? Uh, caller, can you hear me? Oh, well, did we get you? Hi, is it, is there it, you are. Oh, yeah, hi. Um, so I just wanted to point out that uh, sometimes, or a lot of times, the uh, the reasons why politicians uh, do things are not really why they're stated. They expose, uh, when you talk about transporting oil through pipelines, like the Keystone XL that was shut down uh, by, by Obama, like uh, supposedly because of uh, the, uh, the environmental repercussions, but uh, there's also a, there's also a theory that uh, you might, might explore where uh, one of his big backers was um, uh, from Berkshire Hathaway, and before this all happened, uh, Berkshire Hathaway um, invested a lot in trains that have north and the north south uh, routes. So after the Keystone XL pipeline was shut down, the only way to get that that uh, oil down there was through these trains. So the environmental um, impacts were kind of the uh, the the reason on the surface, but beneath the surface there might have been other reasons for shutting it down to sway the traffic going one way or another. No, and you and you make a good point. Yeah, uh, uh, there's always this d debate on what is the most efficient way to move this um, and and the safest way. And and of course this you know assumes that it still needs to be done <laughs> you know and and that's where for those of us who kind of resist the 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 continued dependency and addiction on fossil fuels uh, you know the idea of coming up with, with a safer way to even distrib distribute yeah. or or get the stuff to market especially to um, to I mean, to foreign I, markets I uh, isn't really a problem but no but i understand what you're saying but uh, but you're right when you get into this battle between pipelines and and uh, and rail or even truck you 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 can also you can see where where a pipeline if it's shut down can 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 boost up somebody's bottom line who may be more involved in the trucking of oil or in the in, in pulling or in the investing in, in these in these rail cars these inadequate rail cars that are handling it and so you you make a good yes, point yes, about how there's yes, yes. there's ways that people make money and they say they can oppose yes, it one way but not oppose it a different way yes, uh, there, there are plenty of towns that you might have uh, you might have heard in the news uh, where where they're saying they don't want these what they call bond trains going through their towns mm -hmm. where if there's an accident it they, they the type of explosion would literally wipe the town off off the map. Yeah, there, there are, there's always there's always safety concerns, and it's always the people, and it's always uh, collateral and bystanders that that would have to bear the risks of all these things while somebody else gets the profit. Well, and the the entire length of, of the Hudson River. I mean, the the that that. CSX track that runs along the Hudson. We, you know, we've we've lot for years have looked at you know the bringing the Hudson River back after, uh, and and of course it's you can never co completely remediate the damage that has been done to the Hudson by GE and so many mm -hmm. other you know the oil industry and that kind of stuff. But you know you run these bomb trains along even if you don't have an explosion, just the idea of uh, you know of a derailment and a leak could you know tip the scales completely the other way and set back years and years of um, you know of progress in terms of you know the comeback of the Hudson River I also think that and we've brought up um, uh, politicians and uh, the Dakota Access pipeline has been brought up I just want to throw this out there so that folks are uh, are aware that um, Associated Press on February 19th just a couple days ago and the New York Post um, on February 21st both uh, released articles that um, refer that uh, that state that North Dakota uh, regulators will okay an extension of the Dakota Access pipeline so um, no dapple is not over. Well, and and, and again, uh, the, the characterization that, that Obama stopped the Keystone XL pipeline, um, you know, these things are not really stopped. They're they're just put on hold, and and so they they really don't. The the bulk of the even the Keystone XL pipeline was was built during uh, the Obama administration. The only thing that wasn't completed was the final connection, and this is where the feds actually played a role because it was uh, it was a pipeline that imported tar sands oil. It would it would allow tar sands oil to cross from the Canadian border to the U.S. border. That's why the State Department and and uh, and, the, and the feds had 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 some uh, such a stake in this thing. And and while they did hold it up for environmental reasons, 
all that means is somebody's got to do, you know, tweak some numbers and change the report enough to uh, to say that they've satisfied them. So, uh, but I, I I appreciate the call. Look, we're at the bottom of the hour, so we're gonna we're gonna take a break. We'll go out on a little bit of music here again, uh, allow Regan and I to catch our breath, and then we'll come back and um, and rally it down to the, to the wire with your uh, with your phone calls. This is John and Regan. This is Let's Talk. All right, thanks for coming back. This is John Kane with uh, Regan DeLoggins. This is Let's Talk. Hey, I want to uh, remind people that tonight at 7.30, we are going to uh, begin an event uh, by showing uh, Invasion. This is a, a short film that kind of sh- uh, tells the 10-year history of resistance at, in Wet'suwet'en territory on the the pipelines that they're trying to put through uh, through their territory. And it, it's the good foundation to, to lay to talk about where that conflict is today day so um and that's what we're we're going to do that we're going to carry the ball after the film uh we're going to take some questions i've got some video clips uh, from, i got house of commons footage i know it's not the most thrilling stuff but it's it's, it's interesting to see native issues become such a prominent and uh, and and the prominent issue in uh in canadian in canadian politics so uh anyway we're, we're going to do that tonight that's uh 7:30. It is a WBAI event. I will put out a donation basket, and we'll try to, you know, encourage people to, to make a donation to the to the station uh, via through the show, um, and uh, we we will collect those donations for WBAI. Um, I also want to remind people that, uh, as always, <laughs> we're we're always trying to fund drive or fundraise for for WBAI. So I'm encouraging people to go to the the, the pledge line, go to 516-620-3602, make a donation, a one time donation. Look, I know some of you guys are out there doing pretty well in this Trump economy. And if you want to give something back, uh, this is a good place to dump a thousand bucks. And I uh, and I will say that um, I will also be collecting, but not for WBAI, but for Giddenton Checkpoint in Wet'suwet'en land. There we um, go. So there, it's two places for you to give your money. So come and bring your rich friends. Uh, yes, please do that. <laughs> I, I, I joked. I said, you know, bring bring uh, bring cash, bring checkbook, uh, and we'll even accept uh, very expensive jewelry. Uh, oh, yeah. But I was only kidding about the jewelry. But uh, I, I, it, it is a box. You can throw anything in there. I guess, but <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so that's the night at 730 at the Brooklyn Commons at 388 Atlantic Avenue, downstairs from here uh, in the media center uh, behind the cafe. So come in, uh, uh, drink something, eat something good and uh, and sit down and spend the evening with us. We'd uh, And it gives me a chance to introduce you to my new uh, my new co-host. Uh, you're hearing her, but now you'll get a chance to see her. If you don't watch us on Facebook Live, you have no idea. So this is your chance to come out and, uh, and meet the crew. So, uh, I, and again, Again, I want to remind people to, to go to the go to the pledge drive uh, uh, pledge line five one six six two zero three six zero two. All right, let let's me take uh, these calls. Yeah, let's let's get to let's do more calls. This is part of my favorite part of the show. So, uh, caller, you're up next. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Is that me? That's you. Okay, hi. My name is Sweet Spirit. Okay, and uh, um, wow, I do children's stories, and I was thinking, what would be great if uh, we can. Uh, I get more history uh, in, in regards to what you all are doing, so that uh, the next generation, which I'm sure they, they they have knowledge, but not a lot. The next generation know what's going on with indigenous people. You know, we're all in the same boat. It seems like you know. Well, and um, the interesting, you you bring up kids because we. Um, one of the things, if you see any of the video, you're going to see that some of our uh, we're, we've got some of our children at these at these blockades. Absolutely, I mean, we're we're this isn't one of these things that we're hiding behind women and children. No, they are actively parts of what we're doing. And and again, high school students, uh, all a bunch walked out of class in response to the um, to the OPP, the o- o- Ontario Provincial Police, going into Tayendinega and uh, and trying to bust up their blockade. They actually sparked more blockades and. Uh, and and again, you know, our young people, you know, walked out of school. They did they did some walkouts. Um, um, you know, young people I'm- are being arrested. <laughs> uh, yesterday, um, at in Vancouver, um, uh, Danielle Guerrero uh, was arrested on her 19th birthday. Um, wow. So we have our 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 youth are out there on the front lines. They are the front lines, especially our two spirit and our femme youth are um, in risking their livelihoods, their bodies, their uh, their futures, you know, all of this in order to stand with Wet'suwet'en. So I, I don't think it's, um, I, I do think that the, the stories uh, have to be framed and told uh, to our young people. Um, and, and they have to understand, you know, what, I mean, look, I, 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 may, I posted something on Facebook last week. You know, as I get older, I realize that, you know, <laughs> 
I'm not quite the physical uh, threat that I, <laughs> that I once was. Um, but as I look at some of these young people coming up, I'm, I'm, I'm proud of what they're doing and the stances they're taking. And, but they, they have to be not just encouraged, but they have to, uh, they have to be empowered. And I think that's, uh, that's an important part of it. Yeah, I was thinking it would be great if we can have uh, three from the indigenous, uh, three youngsters from the indigenous uh, um, tribe, three from the African American, three from the Asian, three from the Latin, because we don't need a Greta to, to come to our country and tell us what we need to do. Okay, we know what we need to do, but we don't have the voice. Okay, so I hope really she doesn't have to come back to these United Snakes of America <laughs> to, uh, to tell us, and uh, it would be great if we can have a tribe of 12 of the very of the, of the uh, different groups that I just mentioned. And also, sister, what, what is the name of your, your group, Cause your, your organization? Because I, I didn't write, I, you were talking so fast, I couldn't write it down. Oh, uh, the, the collective that I'm in? Um, it's Indigenous Kinship Collective. Kin, like K-I-N-D. K-I-N-S-H-I-P, Kinship uh, yes. Collective. Uh, we uh, have a website, we're uh, on Instagram, Facebook, uh, the usual, the usual suspects, if you will. Um, uh, and if you're interested in getting more involved or just following the work we do, that's the best way to get in contact with us. What's the first? What's the first uh, name? Indigenous. Got, oh, indigenous. Okay, indigenous kinship collective. Dot com. Yep. Thank you, my love. No problem. Thank you so much for your call. Well, thanks for calling. Hey, before I go to the next caller, one thing, and we touched on this a couple of weeks ago, but it's, uh, you know, sometimes we we lose our flow a little bit. You know, I I can't. You can't talk about this, um, this, this, in, these industries, these pipeline industries, these extractive industries, without talking about the direct connection to missing and murdered Indigenous Absolutely. women. Uh, we didn't bring it up today, but the when they when they do these extractive industries, when even when they build these pipelines, what they do is they come in with uh, and they build a little community. They, uh, it's not a community. It's a man camp. They build these man camps mm -hmm. where men have left their families, oftentimes from you know back east or you know from Vancouver. They, they left their families from the the cities that they come from, so their wives and their children, and then they're living in this you know. You know uh, these testosterone-filled man camps where um, where behavior and uh, morality oftentimes is thrown out the window. And this is why we uh, oftentimes th these man camps are uh, the clients of the Sex Slave Trade Act. Mm -hmm. um, many of these, uh, or sex slave trade industry, I should say, uh, this is where uh, many Native women end up uh, missing or, or 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 murdered, and there's a direct connection to these man camps and and some of what uh, uh, what is done to uh, to indigenous people. Uh, you know, I mentioned also on previous shows that there's so much of the Canadian infrastructure is in remote areas where it is only native population that is nearby. Well, that's also one of the reasons that these man camps uh, oftentimes target native women because there's nobody else around and there's also no law enforcement around to protect them. So um, so I. I I wanted to mention that too in passing so i know we're, we're we got folks on the line so i want to go to the calls but uh i wanted to mention that in passing because i realized i hadn't brought it up so let me go to the caller caller you're up next what's your name where are you calling from hi it's lee calling from the bronx hi lee hi um the website where the film can be viewed did you say it's just invasion invasion if you go on you uh, on youtube or you just search google but if you go to youtube just uh, type in invasion you um if you do it in all caps, it should show up as yeah. one of the first. I know there's a couple other films by the same name. So, but invasion, or if you put in uh, pipeline, or you know, um, I know what Sowetan isn't the easiest thing to spell either. But uh, um, but if you if you type in invasion um, or indigenous alongside of it or something like that, it'll it'll, it'll come right up. But uh, it's a short twenty minute film, uh, and but it it really does pack a pretty good punch. And some of those very people that were in the film were the ones who you know came out to Mohawk territory this past week. Okay, thank you for that. And also, you indicated real people's video. No, nope, real people's media. Oh, media. Real okay. people's media. Huh? Yep. Yep. Realpeople'smedia.com. Yep. Oh, can you also mention another one? A T T N? No, A P T N. It's a Aboriginals People's Television Network. A P T N. Dot C A is probably. In fact, you know what? It might be dot C A on Real People's Media, as a matter of fact, because it's on the Canadian side. So it might be dot C A. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. But if you just I'd be but, interested in knowing more about what's going on, and also whether or not I could get your email and perhaps get a reading list for adults as well as children. You know what? Go to my go to my website. My website is called letstalknative.com, and you can contact me through there. But it's just letstalknative.com. Um, and you know, it's funny. I used to do a blog, and I did have a reading list put up on there. But I, I should put one together for my for my website as well. Um, but yeah, just just go to my website, and you can find my. You can contact me through there. It's easier uh, easier to do it through there. Um, but the. Um, I, you know, among the books that I have to recommend right off the top though are the Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz books, mm-hmm. uh, Indigenous and Indigenous Peoples' History of the United States, uh, and all all Indians, all real Indians have died off, um, and twenty other myths about Native Americans. That's uh, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz and um, and uh, uh, Dina Gillio Whitaker involved in that one. Okay, and that's Let's Talk Media dot com. No, Let's Talk Native dot com. Oh, you know, I have a cold, and I'm just not. Here. Well, yeah, let's talk native. That's the, that's the name of my show from back home. It's called Let's Talk Native. So you go to Let's Talk Native dot com. You can find all that, and it's got links to my shows, videos, uh, all that other stuff, podcasts. Okay, so it's Let's Talk Video. Native, guys. no, Let's Talk Native dot com. Native. Okay, thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Lee. Okay, thanks. All right, let me go to another caller. We're, we got about 10 minutes left here, so uh, we'll, we'll get a few more in here. Caller, you're up next. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hello? Hello. Oh, hi, John. This is Pat from South Dakota. Hey, Pat. Thanks for calling. And hi, Reagan. Hi, how are you? Good to meet you. Um, I, I'm just... Oh, I was watching Democracy Now! to look for their updates because they did so well on... Um, Standing Rock, mm. and they're not doing anything. But, yeah, I haven't but seen anything on Democracy people. Now yet. No, not at all. They have not, and I've invited they're, them. I'm going to call them out right now. Um, I've invited Democracy Now to uh, both uh, two out of our three actions for Wet'suwet'en, and they have not shown up. So, and they give the company line. They're not talking. They haven't talked to anybody, uh, any Indians. They're talking. You know, they're just going by what the the news articles are saying. Well, and there's so much good information out there. I mean, you, uh, again, some of the video from the House of Commons and some of the stuff, when you realize that th- th- this issue has become the premier issue on, uh, you know, on the on the Canadian side, it's amazing that the United States, that that even democracy now is just going to ignore, ignore what's happening. And especially since it's so closely related to everything. Well, it's the same issue. It's the same issue that we experience here. And, I, and the other thing, it might... The difference between what's going on in Canada and what happened in South Dakota is that in Canada they're on unceded land, mm. which means it's a it's an it's a foreign invasion. Absolutely, as opposed to a pipeline problem. And yeah, and, and, and I th- I think that's a that's a good point, but but also I think this is some of the language that that we as uh, as native people on the U.S. side of that imaginary line we've got to uh, take a firmer stance on on how we view our lands. I know I live on Seneca territory, and that land is essentially unceded as well. I mean, uh, the Senecas have absolute and original title to their land; it's not held in trust by the United States. Um, and and but there, but both the U.S. and Canada play this game about lands that they say are are held in trust for the use and enjoyment of native people um and it's a, it's a manipulation of of you know not just language but uh, but even legal descriptions and you know we we often hear people talk about the process the feed a trust process where where we reacquire lands and we bring them back into our um in, into our uh, into our control but if it's being put into tr- in, held in trust by the federal government it really isn't i think that we have to take a stronger stance on on securing and claiming and asserting original title to our lands and that's really different um to where i'm from which um is choctaw nation uh and our land is um uh, land allotments which are privatized owned pieces of land so like a, a family owns a land or a person owns a land. So our land is completely, um, is seated in a different way. It's all our, state title, but it's, it's, it's state, na- yeah. individual native people own it, but it's not recognized. That's yep. where a lot of, you know, the, the folks, Tuscarora well, and South for, Carolina, stuff like that, they all have that same That's place. how it is in Oklahoma. Well for, well, for us, we have allotment lands, but I discovered that it's 
and it's under control of the BIA. So exactly. if we wanted to do anything on our land, we'd still have to go through the BIA. So it's not; it's still not under our control. No, it's yeah. That's how it is. That's how it is um, in Oklahoma as well. It's not. Uh, it's not our land in the same way that Wet'suwet'en is unceded. Yeah, and, and even the allotment stuff gets confusing because there, there's two there's separate standards there. Yep. You know what Regan's talking about are, is land where it's just individual Native people who have a state deed to the land. Yep. Because it, it got subdivided that way what you're talking about is is allotment under the the allotment acts and that kind of stuff where the land is generally is considered native land but it's allotted through the bureau of indian affairs and the overall underlying title is uh that the bureau of indian affairs claims that they're holding it in trust for native people and and that's all problematic i mean we we've got to go back to asserting original title on our lands and let's not forget that national parks are native land yeah yeah and my third issue is that uh, you mentioned man camps, and I just wanted to say that the United States and Canada were all created with man camps. Yes, they're still man so camps. Look, look, look at the makeup of uh, look at the makeup of their uh, of their parliaments and their Congress, and tell me that those aren't man camps. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, you because make a so good it's point. Nothing new. Yeah, no. well, yeah, it's true. I mean, the folks who came over on the boat with with Columbus, it wasn't exactly you know um, families that came over. And in fact, uh, on the west coast, all of those um, uh, those missionaries and all of the, the the you know all of the the so called settler colonialism that took place on the west coast was was all men that that ba and some of these men had families you know uh, what they called back home um, what the military was all, I mean let's face it the military was was uh, was a man camp that's what that was all about absolutely and so no you uh, that that makes a good point I think when we when we reduce this man camp to some sort of um, uh, new phenomenon associated with with these industries it's something that has been a part of that that system of of men leaving their families and then living a completely different life i mean it, it's crazy because you know even these guys who claim to be ministers and uh and preachers they would they would be a part of these these movements these, uh, whether it was a military or whatever and it's like all of that that so-called you know christian morality would go right out the window when it came down to killing native people so I, I thank you for. Well, they, go ahead, Pat. They did it. They they did it. it their whole thing was conversion. Yeah. And, and conversion was to be done in any way possible. And if murder was part of conversion, then that was good too. Well, conversion yeah. was just about saving the soul, not the human being. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Pat, I think I, I appreciate you calling, especially from South Dakota. It's good to hear from you. <laughs> thank you, and I will keep trying to call more because this show. I really appreciate your point of view. You're very um, honest as far as um, the difference between our ways and the white man's ways. Mm -hmm. And that um, we're not getting this kind of information or talk or anything down in the lower 48. Yeah, no, I, I, and I appreciate that. And I'm going to keep doing it as long as I can. And I'll always find ways to get uh, get our perspective out there. So I appreciate you, you listening, being among the people that listen. All right, that's Pat from South Dakota. It's, it's good to get yeah. that call. All right, we got uh, got time for probably just maybe only just one more, but we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll try it. Uh, call, you're up next. What's your uh, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hey, John, this is Joe from New Jersey. Hey, Joe, how you doing? Hi, how you doing? Good. Um, I really appreciate, uh, like, the Canada, they, did they stop the line or no? I'm sorry. Say, did, did, well, In yeah. Canada, did they stop the line or? The pipeline? No, it's still, um, it's still. They're still trying to build the line. Yes, so uh, it to. hasn't been stopped. But uh, but this is this is where the point of contention is. You, you've got these, the Wet'suwet'en people um uh, interfering with these uh, pipeline uh, personnel going in to build this thing, and you have the okay. RCMP trying to uh, clear the way for them to do it, and and that's why all these other native territories, including the Mohawk territory, said, "No, we're not going to let you get in there and sure. interfere with with with, with, with the Wet'suwet'en people." So that's where it all came from. That's great. I can't, you know, like I said, I just can't believe. Uh, is it a coincidence that they're going through this land, or that somebody didn't go through? You know, it it's just... not. They've, um, they've specifically, um, the hereditary chiefs have actually provided an outline and for the pipeline to not go through with Suetan land and to go around it. Um, and that has been ignored. Um, they actually were supposed to have a meeting yesterday, um, in which um, uh, the 
uh, the local Canadian government was invited into its territory to start having discussions about this, and they uh, declined and cancelled right before the meeting, um, the Canadian side, not the Wet'suwet'en side. So um, there is plans for the pipeline to continue to, continue to go through. They do not have to go through Wet'suwet'en land. It's a, it's a strategic choice to undermine the sovereignty of the Wet'suwet'en people. But it, it comes down to this, this whole issue about whether native lands can be considered sacrifice zones and native people yep. can be considered uh, less less important. I mean, and this is sometimes they do this based on population, mm -hmm. but but the reality is if you can do these pipelines where there aren't you know, where there aren't Canadians there, then that's, you know, out, out of sight, out of mind. And, you know, of course, the problem ends up being is it, it puts Canada in, a, in an awkward spot when when native people all of a sudden start pushing back and saying, look, your infrastructure goes through our territory. So you better be careful what you're doing here. And, and so now uh, they've came, they've come to the realization that some of that infrastructure is in is in danger because uh, because native people aren't, aren't taking it anymore. Uh, look, I want to uh, I want to thank you for calling in. It's uh, it's it's great to hear from you. We do have to get out of here. I do want to uh, as I go. I want to um, thank. We did get a twenty five dollar donation, and I know we do get uh, people who join the buddy list every uh, every show. Uh, like to get that cranked. I'd, lo I'd love to get up to sixty on that. So um, if we're right around forty. If we can get uh, twenty more buddies, that would that would be great. Um, we're we're uh, like I said, we're gonna get out of here. But I do want to pitch the the pledge line one more time before before we go. That's five one six six two zero. 3602. Uh, the website is www.give2, that's the number two, wbai.org. Um, one time donation, nothing's too small, uh, certainly nothing's too large either. <laughs> so, by all means, uh, give what you can. If you want to do something on a monthly basis that, uh, that you can budget in $5 a month, $10 a month, $15 a month, um, become a WBI buddy and uh, and uh, we'll send you a tote bag and you put carry your gro groceries home with it. And please join us tonight for a screening of invasion. Please uh, do. Please come out. Uh, we're at the Brooklyn Commons tonight. We'll we'll be there early, but we'll we're going to try to get things underway at uh, at seven thirty. Um, and and again, come join us. We will be back here next week. Uh, so we look forward to, to doing it all again. This is John with Regan. This is Let's Talk. Yahweh.